Imagine for a moment you take a seat at a bar and get to chatting with a total stranger. After a few beers, they tell you an incredible story about the time they beat an MMA world champion in a fight. A tall tale to be sure, unless you're talking to one of the 10 fighters on our list today. You probably won't recognize most of the names in this video. Who the fuck is that? But make no mistake, each one of them has the rare privilege of saying that they stood in front of some of the best of all time in combat sports and walked away with a win when so many others who did more than them in their career careers cannot. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and this is 10 times below average fighters beat the best. A quick note about the title, we used the wording below average so you'd understand the concept of the video instantly. We're not trying to bash these fighters, we're using that phrase in the context that most fans do as it pertains to the very highest level of the sport. So we mean these fighters didn't win any other major titles or beat any other notable names, but they were more than capable of getting the impressive victories we're going to discuss and deserve as much respect as any other fighter. All right, so with that said, let's talk about number 10, Bart Palaszewski versus Anthony Pettis. Before the Wheaties box, before the UFC lightweight championship, before the Showtime kick and WEC gold, Anthony Pettis was undefeated at 9-0 with about as much prospect hype as one could get. After clearing Mike Campbell in his WEC debut in under two minutes with a triangle choke, and prior to that setting the Milwaukee regional scene on fire with his flashy finishes, it looked like the world belonged to young Anthony. It was simply a matter of time. Bart Palaszewski didn't get the memo on Pettis being the future of the sport, though. A hardened 45-fight veteran with bouts against Jim Miller, Ricardo Lamas, and Clay Guida, the Polish fighter had seen just about everything he was going to in the sport, and no amount of spinning shit was going to scare him. The fight was just about even on the feet for the majority of the three rounds. In the third, the two would exchange knockdowns with Anthony absolutely getting the better of the two, but the real story was Palaszewski's grappling, showing the early blueprint on how to beat Showtime, earning six and a half minutes of control time on his way to an upset victory victory via split decision. Bart would go on to the UFC and notably defeat Tyson Griffin with a knockout, but after that dropped three straight and retired, never earning any major world titles or cereal boxes like the man whose undefeated streak he shattered back at WEC 45. Number 9. Sarah Elio vs. Amanda Nunes Since the women's goat hit the big time, she's only ever lost to title contenders or champions. Alexis Davis beat her in Strike Force, Kat Singano in the UFC, both of them challenged Ronda Rousey for bantamweight gold, and then of course recently Julie Juliana Pena temporarily took the throne at 135 from Nunes. The only other person in all of combat sports who can say they beat the best women's fighter ever when she was competing for major promotions is Sarah D'Elio. From 2010 to 2017, Sarah amassed an 11-7 record and fought for Strikeforce, Bellator, as well as Invicta. And while she did compete against notable names like Ronda Rousey, Julie Kedzie, and Shayna Baszler, she never quite made it to the title picture in any of those promotions and probably most impressively subbed Vanessa Porto. But she can always say she beat a Amanda Nunes and beat isn't even the right word, really. She dominated her at Invicta FC4, earning 30 26s across the board. Now, one of those missing points was for an illegal upkick on the part of the Lioness, but make no mistake, Delio pretty much stayed on top of Nunes for the whole 15 minutes and entirely neutralized any offense she attempted. A year later, Amanda would join American Top Team and her career would skyrocket. Number 8. Luis Azaredo versus Anderson Silva. Now, we've talked on this channel about the Spiders' losses in Pride, both of which were pretty shocking in Daiju Takase and Ryo Chonin. Submission wins both, but if you know anything about Anderson at that time, he was in a bad place with the sport and trying to get himself together, which of course he would very shortly after, going on to be the greatest middleweight ever. But in his early career, a time period he would win six straight fights on his way to a Shudo championship before entering Pride FC, a young spider ran into a game plan by Luis Azaredo that would only be as effectively implemented again a decade later by one Chael P. Sonnen, the P is for dominating from top position the entire fight. Azaredo would remain on top of Silva for the majority of the bout, raining down some vicious knees to the head. Uncle Chael probably wishes he could have done some of that. And while we did get a few fleeting moments of Anderson's signature clowning out his opponent and a wild flurry late, it wasn't anywhere near enough with Luis earning an easy UD win. Azaredo would go on to compete at some Pride Bushido events but not fare very well, twice losing to Takadori Gomi and getting KO'd by Joachim Hansen. The only other truly notable win of his career was against Paul Daly at Cage Rage in 06, but Luis would end his career with a record
record of 15-10, and 10, having never fought for a world title or remaining unbeaten for more than three fights. Still, not many folks can say they beat Anderson Silva. As of this writing, I'm hoping Jake Paul isn't added to that list. Please, boxing gods. Number 7. Marvin Eastman vs. Rampage Jackson Probably one of the few names you'll recognize on this list, Marvin Eastman came to MMA after two years as a JUCO All-American wrestler, two seasons as running back for UNLV, and a stint in the CFL. So the dude was no joke as an athlete when he started training MMA, and while he wouldn't know it at the time, the first fight of his career would be the biggest win he ever got. Eastman was paired with a fellow wrestler in Young Rampage Jackson, who was just two fights into his career, having defeated Mike Pyle in his pro debut. Jackson's long socks would not save him from Eastman leg-kicking the shit out of him all fight long, truly shades of his UFC light heavyweight title loss to Forrest Griffin. Rampage was pretty well neutralized for the majority of the fight, getting reversed and mounted on the ground after his only successful takedown. Jackson couldn't even stand when the final horn sounded with Eastman earning the clear UD to become the king of the cage super heavyweight champion. Yeah, man. Yeah, cool. Look at him, look Great at him. Up, man. That's, that's a hard look right at that. There, baby. Look at that. That's hard there. Page would go on unbeaten until his Pride 15 bout with Sakuraba, and of course you know the rest. Big star in Japan, eventual UFC title, and a fan favorite status for life. As for Eastman, he would fight some of the best, Rich Franklin, Vitor Belfort, Glover Teixeira, ending his career with a record of 18-15-1. He would have a few brief stints in the UFC, one of which saw him rematch Jackson, who was debuting for the promotion. The fight would be much different though, with Page winning via KO in the second. Number 6. Vicheslav Datsik versus Andre Arlovsky. All right, so remember at the beginning of the video where I said everybody on this list deserves respect? I only meant that in the fighting sense. If you've seen anything we've done on career criminal Vicheslav Datsik, you know that he's into some pretty wild shit, which also pertains to his fight career. We really don't have time in this entry to get into it, but I encourage you to watch all the videos we've done that feature Mr. Datsik for more info. As far as his career record, Red Tarzan would call it in 2006 at six and nine, with the only promotion you'd ever heard of that he fought for being M1. Why Vicheslav has made our list is because he KO'd future UFC champion and analyst career heavyweight Andre Arlovsky in his first ever professional bout. Amazingly, for a fight that was shot with a bologna sandwich in 1999, we have Boss and the Fight Professor on commentary. And I gotta tell you, they are having a great time throughout this weird as fuck fight. A career mount? <laughs> what, 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 what position is this? Datsik looks like he's got no clue what he's doing on the feet or on the ground, or as a human being for that matter. It is seriously the most bizarre six minutes of MMA I've seen in a while, and it looked as if he had no chance whatsoever. But then suddenly Arlovsky was dead shotted out of nowhere. I mean, absolutely out cold. What a weird ass moment. For the next decade of his career, Andre would be only defeated by world champions or title contenders, but in that regard and only that regard, Vicheslav Datsik shares their company. Number five, Kim Hoon versus Robert Whitaker. Can I start off by saying that Bobby had the freshest cut in the whole arena that night? Look at that hair. Bring that look back, man. In case you're unfamiliar, Robert Knuckles III is a former UFC middleweight champion and is at current the number one ranked contender in the division. His opponent in this entry, Kem Hoon, well, he's, he's Kem Hoon, a South Korean fighter who at the time of this bout was 8-7-1 and, and would go on to be 10-12-2 before his career went inactive in 2019. All of his fights taking place on the Asian regional scene and his only other win of slight note being Ricky Fukuda. Bobby was unbeaten at 7-0, his future in the UFC only a year away. But on this night, a failed takedown attempt would see much of this three-minute bout with the former UFC champ on his back throwing up sub attempts to no avail. And when he finally did get top position, Hoon secured a triangle choke, and that was all she wrote for Legend Fighting Championship 6. Oh, he's got it. This is bad for Whitaker. Oh, Whitaker's struggling to get out of this. He's tapped. Oh my. He's tapped. Not only is the win a feather in Kim's hat, he also has the only submission ever over the Reaper. Number 4. Joaquin Fajeda versus Junior Dos Santos. All right, hear me out on this one. The Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man I think would have been a better nickname for JDS than Sigano, as he looks so friendly and huggable but will absolutely fuck you up. Seriously, how perfectly similar are they? When Dos Santos captured UFC gold KOing Cain Velasquez in just 64 seconds, he was 13-1 and, and had been burning through everybody with an insane seven-fight win streak in the 
UFC at heavyweight that he would extend to nine before finally losing in his rematch with Kane. The only defeat he'd had before he was considered one of the greatest heavyweights in the world would come in a rematch against Joaquin Fajeda less than a year before his UFC debut. The two met initially at XFC Brazil in April 2007, with Fajeda gassing so hard he refused to get up from his guard, and the referee called it. In their rematch at MTL Final, however, Joaquin would get the job done nearly as fast as JDS beat Kane. After a few quick exchanges, Fajeda scored a takedown, only to get swept by Junior, who then found himself in an armbar forced to tap. <laughs> The way he's celebrating, it's like you can tell he knew this was a massive win. Joachim would spend the rest of his career on the regional scene with no other notable wins, retiring in 2018 with a record of 21 and 12. Number three, Mitsuhiro Ishida versus Gilbert Melendez. When Gilbert Melendez showed up in the UFC in April of 2013, it was seriously such a big deal. We were finally going to find out who was the greatest lightweight in the world because at the time, as Strikeforce's six-time defending champion, he had legitimate claim to that title, and his fight with UFC champion Ben Henderson would settle it. Prior to that massive debut, Melendez had only lost a single bout in strike force against Josh Thompson, who he would go on to defeat twice, ending their rivalry on top. The only other loss of his entire career would come on New Year's Eve 2007 at Yarinoka against Mitsuhiro Ishida. Now, the reason this one is so high on the list is because Gil was already at that point the strike force lightweight champion and was undefeated at 13 0 in his career. Career. Ashida had some career success prior to the bout in Shudo and Pride, only to get soccer kicked by Takanori Gomi the previous New Year's Eve. But Mitsuhiro had different plans for ringing in 2008, mainly spending 15 minutes taking Gil Melendez down 450 times. The grappling was relentless from start to finish, and while El Nino did have a sweet slam and a solid knee to the head on the ground at one point, any other offense he was looking to put together was almost entirely nullified. And when he did finally have a solid position, he was nearly subbed with a nasty arm lock. You know, different angle, the same thing as he's trying to work his way out of it. It's the front side of it. You know, that arm is fully extended. Ashida earned the clear UD win, which would nearly two years later result in him getting a shot at old Gill's strike force interim strap. But this time he'd be TKO'd in the third and never found another big win in his career before retiring in 2011. Number two, Ian Freeman versus Frank Mir. Hope you got some tissue ready because you're going to need it after this one. In 2002, Frank Mir was one of the hottest prospects in the sport. He looked like he had it all. And of course, everyone was right. He would go on to be UFC champion and an all-time great heavyweight. His fifth bout was meant to be a showcase for the rising star as the co-main event for UFC 38. His opponent, Ian Freeman, chosen because the event was being held in London and the machine was a well-liked English fighter. Despite being a massive underdog and looked at simply as a stepping stone, Freeman beat the ever-living shit out of Frank Mir. On the ground, on the feet, no matter how desperately Mir cranked his submissions, nothing mattered. He was getting mauled. Frank could barely keep his feet late in the first and the fight was called. Nine years before Brock punished him for taking his strawberries, Ian the Underdog made a mess of Mir's face. It was a perfect performance, and to top off the incredible moment in front of his fellow countrymen, Freeman dedicated the victory to his father, who, at the start of fight week, had been given a grim diagnosis. Two weeks left to live. Brain cancer. Ian nearly canceled the bout when he got the news, but his father knew winning would be legacy defining for his son, and he told him to see it through. After a long pause to hold back tears, Ian ended his dedication by saying, So for you, Daddy, I love you. Following the bout, he would immediately call his mother to tell her the great news, only to find out that his father had passed away a day before the fight. His final wish that nobody tell his son until after he got the job done. While Ian's career after that night wouldn't be particularly notable, his father was right because the win over Mir has stood as one of the sport's all-time great upsets, cementing his son's legacy forever. Number 1. Luciano Azevedo vs. Jose Aldo all right, let's try to bring this thing back up at the end here. For exactly 10 years and 15 days, Jose Aldo would fight 18 men and not one of them would defeat him. Nine straight title defenses, victories over Cub Swanson, Mike Brown, Uriah Faber, Kenny Florian, Chad Mendez, Frankie Edgar. I don't care what anybody says, the man's the featherweight goat in my eyes even still today. But while Connor notoriously ended his reign at UFC 194 in 13 seconds, that 10-year unbeaten run didn't start at fight zero. No, that 
measure began the day after Aldo was defeated by Luciano Azevedo at Jungle Fight 5. With a pro record as of his retirement in 2014 of 17, 9, and 1, Azevedo largely stuck to the Brazilian regional scene, with the exception of a few UK cards and one appearance at Pride Bushido 12 where he lost. A truly unremarkable career, with the exception, of course, of his submission win over the King of Rio. Of course, at the time of the fight, young Aldo was king of nothing yet, but he was undefeated at 7-0, and, oh, and you could see the early formings of his greatness. Only three fights later, he would begin his run in the WEC, but not before Luciano Azevedo took his unbeaten streak with a million desperate takedown attempts, waiting on the ground in his guard a lot, and then eventually in the second, getting the mount before Aldo gave him his back so he could sink in the choke, marking the only submission loss of Jose's entire career. I bet Luciano tells this story every year at Christmas. A big, big thank you to Ben Rosette, who provided that sweet tune you heard in the intro. Check out his music by clicking the link in the description and go give him a follow on his Instagram and Twitter page at Ben Rosette. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.